important JavaScript concepts that every developer should know. Or not. Let's talk about it. What's up, everyone? My name is James Q. Quick, and I do weekly videos on web development related topics, a lot of which are specifically targeted at JavaScript fundamentals. So if you are a beginner JavaScript developer, and you're looking for guidance on what you need to know or how to get better at certain things, this is a great channel for you. So one of my most popular videos that I've done of all time, which has over a million views is five JavaScript concepts that you should absolutely know. And so I kind of like these because they're they're fun topics of giving people insights into like a little bit of a path or like a prioritization of things they should know. And so anytime I come across similar articles, I'm kind of interested in, um, in what other people's take is on what are the most important topics. So I came across this article, important JavaScript concepts that every developer should know. And it's about 10 of them. And this is from someone I've never met before. They didn't reach out and ask me to do a video on this or anything, um, but Madni Agati. And uh, anyway, there's about 10 of these and I was just gonna walk through and kind of give you my take on whether or not I think these things are important for you to actually know. So if you have a chance, I'll have a link to the article, go and, f go and read the article and go and uh, follow Madney on uh, Hashnome. So the first thing, this is always an interesting one. First thing is hoisting. This is, I feel like listed on all of, or a lot of these lists of important concepts to know in JavaScript. And I'll tell you one thing, I don't think I've ever actually used hoisting. I just, I don't think that's the case. And people can let me know in the comments if that's something you use all the time and I'm just crazy or whatever, but I've never used hoisting. So hoisting is the idea, I believe, that you define like a variable name and uh, or you define a variable and it basically takes the, um, the declaration of that variable and kind of bumps it up to the top of the code, which makes it uh, available inside of here. Um, so this is specifically with the var keyword and not with let and const, which is actually a good thing, I think. I think like having I think your code should kind of read the way it is and there should be less like magic going on where the compiler or whatever is, or the interpreter is moving stuff in different locations. Uh, but hoisting, I've, I've never actually used myself. So I'm curious, is hoisting something that you've used? I think it's an important concept to get an idea for, but I wouldn't expect that to be something that you see a lot. Now, another one, and this is almost the exact same response for me, is an iffy. An iffy stands for immediately invoked function expression, and it looks really gross. Basically, you wrap this function inside of parentheses, which then kind of makes it a function expression, and then you have this, you call that function, which basically just like runs this code. And this used to be really popular, I don't know if it is as much anymore, for like library maintainers, and they would basically write all of their code inside of an iffy because it would have its own uh, like namespace or context. Um, so that way the variable names wouldn't conflict with like the global variable names, for example, they would be confined to the actual iffy. Again, and they say data privacy and quick code execution. Again, it's not, it's not something I've ever used before. I think it's one of those names where you could possibly have that on an interview. But if, if I were to give you my opinion on whether or not this is realistically a topic that you should know, I would say no, just because it's not really, not really used. So here's one that I think has like much bigger implications than I think um, the author of this even intended. So the the first is callback or it's callback and higher order functions, which I think are like made to be spread out. So let's start with a callback. A callback is a function that you pass to another function and then that function calls the function parameter, uh, which is not that bad. The reason this is like such a big topic for me is a lot of JavaScript, asynchronous JavaScript works this way. I've done a lot of videos on asynchronous JavaScript as well. So let's say something like set timeout, you pass it a callback function and a time to delay, a time to timeout. And then after that amount of time, it calls that callback function. Uh, you also have like error first callbacks when you're calling APIs, for example, like either it's going to return to you data or an error. And inside of that callback, the callback has two parameters for error and data or whatever you want to call them. So these are like callback functions, I think, are essential to how JavaScript works. I do a lot more like async await versus callback functions and promise.then or promise.catch. Uh, but I think these are essential and you'll see these all the time. So I absolutely think this is a big one. And then a higher order function is specifically a function that takes another function as an argument. Um, 
and is called a hoof. I've never actually heard a hoof. That's a new one for me. Uh, so callback functions uh, essential for JavaScript and specifically async JavaScript. Now this is interesting. I, I wouldn't say this is like um, this is like a topic that everyone should know, uh, but it is something that gets talked about a lot. And this is callback hell. So the idea is that you call something, it returns data, and then inside of there you call something again that returns to another callback function, and you keep indenting. And you'll see, see these kind of referenced as like trees or pyramids or just callback hell in general. So I wouldn't say this is like a concept that's really important to know. I think it's something that like, if you want to understand the memes, you would want to know this. And then it's maybe something that you would experience. But again, I think I think promise.then, promise.catch, and async await, I think are replacing a lot of this. Promises is actually next. So you're still likely to see this. I wouldn't, again, say this is like a technical concept to know, but if you want to be on the end of, of what people are creating JavaScript memes about, that would be an interesting one. Now, promises, 100%. I think this is like one of the most one of the one of the most important, I guess, of like this is already a most important concepts, but I think this is like one of a top couple most important concepts in JavaScript because of the asynchronous nature of JavaScript. I think it's extremely, extremely important. So I think understanding not only how to work with promises, so handling dot then and dot catch, if you're using the fetch API in JavaScript to make a request to an API, get data, and then handle the success with dot then handle the catch with or handle the error with dot catch. Those are super important. I think it's also really useful maybe to take this a slightly different way to know how to create a promise yourself. So creating a new promise and a new promise takes a callback function. You can see this in here as its parameter, which has uh, two, which takes two arguments, which are resolve and reject. And that's how promises work. Either they work successfully or they don't work successfully. And so then it would be your responsibility in the code if anything fails to call reject, otherwise to call the resolve, and that will then trigger the dot then or dot catch. So absolutely, promises I think are huge. I would absolutely spend time learning about promises. And then to so the next item on the list is async await. Now this is my preferred syntax for working with promises. Async await uses promises underneath the hood. So don't worry about like this being a totally new thing. It's just what we call syntactical sugar. It just gives you a different syntax for working with as asynchronous code. So let's say you have a uh, promise in here. Instead of saying promise.then to handle the success case, you can await for that thing to finish. And so you to use await inside of a function, you have to mark it as a sync and then you await for that response and then you have that data there. So the code will kind of like pause execution at this point, waiting for that response to come back and then be able to handle it. Now, the one thing that gets missed a lot that is covered here, which is good, is uh, you still have to do error handling. So in regular traditional promises, you have dot then and dot catch. In this case, you just await the promise and then you surround it with a try catch. So a try catch says, let's try to run this, this block of code. If something goes wrong, if there's an error, catch that error and then you have access to log it out or, or uh, show an error message to the user or whatever it is. So async await is definitely my favorite way to work with asynchronous code to work with promises. That's somewhat of a preference. I've like expressed my opinion on YouTube and people gave very aggressive feedback the other way, which is fine. But it's absolutely something I think you should know because async await and promises in general dot then dot catch you'll see all over the place in JavaScript. Now, closures is a cool one. I would say like this is not something I use super often, but I definitely understand what it is. And so the idea is, let's say you define a function inside of another function or uh, something I did recently. Let's say inside of a function, you define a set timeout and the set timeout takes a callback function. So that's defining a more relevantly defining a function inside of a function. Let's say you do that, and then that callback handler for the set event needs access to something that was data that was available in the parent function. Well, closers will basically say, wherever this function is defined, it will have access to the stuff around it based on context. So in this case, you have your outer function, you define a variable B, you have an inner function, and then you return this, um, this inner function. So that means if you call outer function with five, it's going to have five as this parameter in here. It's going to define B as 10. It's going to define this new function. Then it's going to return that function. So then when you call the inner function, which I don't quite see, I think this is actually missing the call 
to the inner function because this should call the inner function and then the result should be five plus 10 and it should log out. Uh, the sum of the two numbers is 10. So the point of this is this inner function, because it's defined inside of the outer function, will have access to the variables that were scoped inside of the outer function, which are the parameter A and then the uh, variable B, which is 10. Event propagation, this is interesting because this is probably where we need to start delim delineating between kind of logical programming JavaScript and then like the DOM JavaScript in terms of working with the browser. But this is this is definitely one that is very useful. So event propagation, let's say you have an anchor tag inside of here, you click this, you can handle the on click. This would probably be better uh, reference at, for a button because this is gonna navigate away uh, or navigate like change pages with the anchor tag. But let's pretend this is a button and you handle the on click of that. Obviously that on click is gonna be called <clears throat> What you may not know though, is that it is automatically gonna propagate up uh, to the parent or bubble up to the parent elements. So this anchor or button is inside of a P tag. That means a P tag is gonna be triggered as on click. That means the wrap uh, div is gonna be triggered and then the body as well. So the way you can, um, it, sometimes you need to make decisions on this where you don't want it to propagate. So inside of your on, click function handler, you can actually call like event.stop propagation. Somebody double check and let me know in the comments. But there's a function that you can call to prevent that from bubbling up to the parents. If you wanna specifically only look at handling a click on this thing and not have that be uh, considered a click on the parent. Example of this is let's say you have a pop-up window and it, it doesn't take up the entire screen. So let's say you want to be able to click on the uh, the outside of the pop-up. So let's say you have a pop-up that's this big, the full screen is this big, and you wanna be able to close the pop-up from clicking on the outside of the pop-up. So there's a little bit of room on the outside. That means you wanna detect clicks on basically the body, which is the entire thing, but not capture clicks on the actual pop-up part. So in the pop-up, you would have an event uh, handler for the on click and you would say, don't let it uh, propagate or bubble up to the parent element because I specifically want to track clicks to this outer area and use that as a way to close this pop-up. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, currying is, is really interesting because every time I see currying, I don't think it's a complicated thing, but every time I see it, I don't, I don't know what it is. So currying is the process of evaluating multiple argument functions and breaking them down into a series of single argument functions. So, okay, so this is a function that takes a parameter that returns a function that takes a parameter that takes a function that returns a parameter and then logs it all out, which means you have to call it like this. That, not something I've ever done. So currying is like, I think people like to have that topic as something like tricky in JavaScript to know. I've never used it. I've never thought about it. I can never define what currying is. So in my mind, this is not super important. Spread operator and destructuring. I'm gonna tackle both of these together. So these are kind of modern, I say modern, but it's been a long time now. Uh, modern syntax, modern syntax. And JavaScript ES6, which was in 2000, I got in trouble for saying 2005 in the past, 2015. So a lot of new features came to JavaScript in 2015, including the spread operator. So the spread operator, if you use it with an array, will take each item in here and it will spread them out into, in this case, a new array. So basically what we're doing here is we're uh, taking every value of colors, spreading it out into this array, my favorite colors, and then adding yellow and black. And then destructuring, this is a way to grab a property from an object or an array and uh, basically name it. So the example of this is they give a good one here. You could go and get the first name, the professor and the passion. It'd be probably be better if these actually had like data aligning with this, but Let's say those are those three different properties. You could go and get each one individually and assign them to a variable name like this. Probably used to that. The alternative to this is you can define like those variables basically inside of an array, which basically with destructuring says assign f name to the first property, prof to the second property, passion to the third property, and so on. You can even like handle the rest of them too if you wanted. And then similar thing with destructuring. So you could go and access my first name and assign it to my first name using the dot syntax. You could do it with the, I don't even know what it's called, quotation syntax. Uh, but in this case, you could do the same thing you did with the array and say, I want to get the value of my F name and create it as a variable. 
You see this a lot in React with like you take in props to a component and then you see people, instead of having props, they destructure the actual items in the array so that you can access the individual variable names directly and not have to go props.xyz. So this is kind of cool. I like this. Um, I enjoy articles like this. I enjoy kind of giving my take on them. I'm curious for you, what of these concepts do you think are the most important? What do you think is missing? And what on here do you not think is the most important? Because I've got a few on here that I just don't think are that important. And I'm curious how you feel about it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll catch you next time.